Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We are recording this podcast on October the 12th, 2020. In an effort to reassure the public about the safety of new vaccines, last week, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration enhanced its standards for COVID-19 vaccine development. The agency's requirements are designed to ensure that there's adequate safety data before any vaccine can be authorized for emergency use. Today, we have the perfect expert with us to discuss this. Dr. Greg Poland is an expert in vaccines, virology, and infectious disease at the Mayo Clinic. Thanks for coming back, Greg. My pleasure, Helena. Well, good to see you today on a Monday. Can yeah. you help us understand the FDA guidelines for vaccines a little bit, and what are the um, standards that are put into place for people who develop vaccines? Really what these are, are anticipating the possibility of an emergency use authorization in EUA. First, we have to remember that a vaccine under EUA meets a lower standard than a fully licensed vaccine. The standard for an EUA is that it may be effective and that it is likely that the benefit outweighs the risk. That's a different standard than a fully licensed vaccine, which says, this vaccine is safe and effective for the indicated reasons. So, so that's number one. Number two, and, and you said it well, uh, in part what these enhanced guidelines, interim guidelines are meant for, is to reassure the public and to set down in writing, here's what our intention is, here's what you can hold us to. And uh, what the FDA is doing is saying they want a median follow-up of at least two months after the second dose or last immunization. Now, why two months? Uh, that seems a little arbitrary. Well, it's not when you recognize that side effects, particularly serious side effects from vaccines, if they're going to happen, tend to happen very quickly. They happen acutely or in the short term. The very rare one in a million chance of Guillain-Barre associated with flu vaccine, that happens within weeks, no more than six weeks. So eight weeks gives you that sort of little safety margin. Um, the other thing that they want to do is they want to see at least five severe cases of COVID in the placebo group. Why that? Well, what they want manufacturers to demonstrate is that the vaccine doesn't just reach an immunologic endpoint, that is an antibody level, but a clinical endpoint, that is, it prevented severe disease. So uh, I I'm congratulate FDA for these interim guidelines. Uh, as you know, they were uh, pushed against and uh, a lot of people didn't want to see it, but I think this goes a long way toward reassuring the public that this is the safety of these vaccines is being taken very seriously by scientists and by the professional public health agencies. I think that actually is a great explanation. It's really good to hear as well because there's such a, a difference sometimes between what we hear in the scientific world and then what we see um, displayed sure. in, the, in the media. And so one of the things I had thought was there's such a push to have a vaccine, to have a vaccine before a certain date. And yeah. then how will we know that vaccine is safe? We don't just okay. want something that is made on a time frame. Greg, could you remind us again what emergency use authorization is? And will this vaccine, when developed and selected, be used for EUA prior to it being released to the general public? It's not required that an EUA be uh, given before a fully licensed vaccine. I think what an EUA is attempting to do in this case is sort of thread that needle between a, a compelling public health need, right? We are at uh, almost 38 million cases uh, in the world, 8 million in the U.S. with almost 220,000 deaths. Uh, as of today. So they're trying to respond to that at the same time of saying, you know, it, it's not like black plague or smallpox. We don't want to expose people to risk and we want to keep people safe. So, so where's that balance? That's what an EUA is attempting uh, to, to do. The other important point about that is that an EUA is generally issued for a specific 
uh, group or subgroup of people. For example, uh, this EUA, if it gets, uh, if, if one gets uh, released, is not going to uh, uh, recommend that children, for example, receive this vaccine under EUA. That, that I cannot imagine that happening. That would be unprecedented. Rather, it's likely to be for healthcare workers, military, the elderly, the, the really high risk people. We've noted that in the US there are increasing cases of COVID-19, but mm. the death rates seem to be falling, although many, many Americans' lives have been lost to this. Is there an explanation for that? It's worth reflecting for a minute. We're only 4% of the world's population, but we are 20% of the caseload in five states, and I wrote them down, Montana, New Mexico, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Vermont. Five states, we have caseloads that have risen by 50, 50%. Um, if anybody says, well, are we in our second wave? Yes, we and Europe are in our second wave as we go into the fall and winter. And you and I have talked about how concerning that is uh, between coronavirus, flu, and, and other respiratory diseases. We have uh, in excess now of 130 cases among 1,300 colleges. So we're seeing the back to school, college students, reopening uh, all happen at a time when caseloads are not suppressed below 5%. So for those of us that study this, that are scientists, this is not a surprise at all. This is absolutely predictable. It is, in fact, irrational that we would say that uh, there are no mandates, everything's completely open. Of course, you're going to have a rise in cases, particularly as it gets colder. We did see a dip, by the way, during the warmer months. We, we had sort of a temporary reprieve in, in a lot of states. So that's the reason uh, that, that we think that case loads are rising. Hospitalizations are rising. Deaths have not yet really risen. Is that a lag period phenomena? I think in part, but probably more importantly, is that I think the highest risk people are indeed taking precautions. It's lower risk people that is obvious to us when we're out in public that are not uh, taking precautions. That's one thing. The other thing is, you know, in 40 weeks, We've learned an amazing amount about how to care for people with COVID. A number of clinical trials have been done. We know something now about what drugs work, when to give them, how to give them. Uh, we know better how to use supplemental oxygen and mechanical ventilation in, in the severest cases. We've understood something about anticoagulation, the use of ECMO in the really severe cases. So what I think think is going to happen is that caseload is going to continue to rise. Hospitalization will lag by a week or two and then continue to rise. The death rate is likely to stabilize or be lower than it was in the past until you get to a point where you overwhelm the medical system. Then you can't bring your best because there's not enough best for everybody and then we'll see death rates start to go up. On a brighter note, the CDC has shared that more Americans are washing their hands. Yeah. And how do you think this might affect the flu season? And how do they know more people are washing their hands? Well, the, actually, your last point is a very good one, Alina, because this is a, a self-reported survey, so, so they don't. Um, but what they did is they surveyed over 4,000 people, about 3,600 answered it, and they looked from October of 2019 to June of 2020. And it was a nationally representative sample. So, you know, it's a, it's a nice study and, a, and an easy one to perform to get a sort of a snapshot of before the pandemic, after the pandemic. But, but again, this is what people are reporting on the phone. And there's the tendency to say, to endorse what you know you should do rather than what you necessarily did. My guess is if we actually had a way to watch them, the rates would be lower. Now, what's good news is that people are washing their hands more often in the situation where they should. When they sneezed or coughed, when they've used 
their home bathroom or a public bathroom before they eat, after they touch their mask, things like that. That's the good news. The not so good news is that, you know, less than 75% of people are regularly washing their hands after using the bathroom or sneezing and coughing. Now, an interesting phenomena was observed. And I, I, I you know, as you know, I, my, my goal is to be absolutely transparently honest. So what I'm about to say doesn't reflect well on us as infectious disease doctors. In the ID conventions that we have, the large meetings, studies have been done where they position someone in the bathroom who is observing. The people in the bathroom don't realize it, but observing whether they wash their hands. Here it goes. Men don't do very well. Women do really well. <laughs> My wife and I were talking about it. I think she's probably right. It's generally the case, I'm generalizing, that women are more often preparing the food for the family. They're more often uh, have the, the child care duties like changing the diaper, whatever. And they recognize the need to wash their hands. And they're also protecting the family from the consequences if they didn't wash their hands. Men, not so much. The other thing that was noticed, and this fits with what I've um, noticed myself, is that uh, people age 18 to 24 tend not to be good hand washers. And one interesting thing, one you'd expect, one you might not expect, um, the, the, the lower the income level or the lower the education, the lower the hand washing. However, if you look by racial groups, whites wash their hands less often than blacks and Hispanics do. If you wear a mask, if you wash your hands, you have dramatically decreased the risk of getting influenza or COVID or any respiratory infection. So when you combine that with getting the flu vaccine, you have truly and significantly reduced your risk of getting flu and of course COVID from the mask and hand washing. Wow, Greg, some of that was just plain gross. You're right. But I have to say that I do think that women commonly wash their hands in the bathroom. I so seldom see a woman leave the bathroom without washing her hands that it sort of shocks me uh, when that does happen. So it's good to know that some of us are getting that done. We apparently, need, we apparently need reminders in the men's bathrooms. And, and let, me, let me just make the point. This is very early on in the pandemic. You and I had a very good discussion about it. It's another reason why we should abandon the cultural habit of handshaking. There's no yes, need I, for it. And yeah. it, doesn't, it, it only offers risk, not benefit. Greg, I want to wrap this up today with a rather poignant uh, question from one of our listeners, something that I'm sure is on the minds of many. I happen to be residing in Minnesota in a state that is mandating the wearing of masks uh, in any public spaces. Some states are not. Uh, a coworker just shared with me that they were in Wisconsin and, at a rest and chose not to go to a restaurant because the service workers at the restaurant were not wearing masks. There's some societal pressure as far as whether we wear masks or not. And I, I think that's got to be hard for some of our young people. And this listener had indicated that they were having a difficult time convincing their children to wear masks when others weren't doing so. A bit of peer pressure, if you will. Especially probably important as we move into the holiday season and we have more people perhaps coming home who haven't been home before. And I'm wondering what what you think about that and what advice would you give this listener? Yeah, you know, I, I'm sympathetic with that. It, it's hard. But, you know, let's kind of try to break that, that down. So uh, the first thing, trying to be a little amusing about it, is there's another the talk that parents need to have with their kids. <laughs> and that talk is also about health and well-being, but it's about the precautions that are science and evidence-based to protect not only them, but the people around them. This is a really good opportunity to not only teach that aspect of science, but to begin to culcate 
a, a direction in our society that, that I've mentioned many times, and I think we'd be better off moving from this hyper individualistic me culture to a we culture. Okay. I do lots of things to protect you. Yes, it protects me too, but it protects everybody around me, whether it's driving a car, covering my cough, wh whatever it would be. So, so I think that's one important thing. The second thing is that the, the discomfort is the change, not the reality. So um, I remember very well, the very first time this article came out in the New England Journal about kids wearing helmets to protect against head, head injuries. I live in a neighborhood that's mostly physicians and other healthcare providers. That weekend, all the kids had helmets on, okay? So did they want to wear them? No. Did the other kids make fun of them? Yes. But it has gotten to be such that most always kids are wearing helmets nowadays. And that's, that's a very good thing. So I, I think that we will get used to it, as many Asian countries and cultures have. I think it's a good thing. I think we have to explain it. We have to help others to understand it. But we shouldn't shy away, again, from evidence-based recommendations, simply because they are uncomfortable as we go through a period of change. They are. Uh, I don't like it any more than anybody else. I'm used to wearing a mask at work. Uh, as a physician, I don't particularly like having to wear it at, at the store, for example. Um, two of my kids are, are returning home after being away for six months. I want to get my arms around those kids and kiss them and hug them. And the reality of it is, and we've talked on the phone, that that won't be able to, to happen. I hope my head will be better engaged than my heart because my heart wants to do that. But my head says, you know, better that uh, we kind of stay apart for the first five to seven days and be sure, you know, all is well. And, and then we can get together with masks on. And so, you know, it, it's a tough thing. I, I've tried to work with a lot of parents because the kids don't want to wear them. And if there are other kids whose parents aren't enforcing that, it makes it more difficult for everybody. Uh, the best thing we could do, and we're seeing it in countries that have this, this mantra of we, not me, and it works. Thanks so much, Greg, for a great visit today and a chat. Well, I look forward to next time. Thank you all, too, for being here today. We thank Greg Poland, our infectious disease, virology, and vaccine expert from the Mayo Clinic, and we wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu. Thanks for listening and be well.